10 million people die from cancer every single year. And there are researchers, doctors, scientists, all around the world trying to beat cancer. And then there's me, a mathematician. All I know how to do is crazy multiplications in my head, such as, I don't know, 746 times 29. I have no background in cancer, no background in biology or medicine. The answer is 21,634, by the way. But anyway, the question is, how can I use mathematics to beat cancer? So yeah, let me first tell you a little bit about myself. I did my bachelor's degree over in Oxford in the UK in mathematics. It was a largely theoretical course, I would say, and that kind of became a problem when I was looking for jobs because all of the well-paid jobs, and of course everyone wants a well-paid job, had three skill set requirements. And the first one was computer programming, the second was data analysis, and the third one was statistics. Now, bearing in mind, Every single company has data. Every single one that you can think of has data. 99.9% .9 of those companies want to do something with that data. And to do that, you need a statistician. There's the old saying where you can do statistics without data science, but you cannot do data science without statistics. So yeah, I just decided to do a master's degree in statistics. I graduated, got a pretty well paid job as an epidemiologist, would you believe? So an epidemiologist, no one knew what one was back then, but of course everyone does now because of COVID-19. Actually, an interesting story. So an ex-colleague of mine, we started the very same day. After I left the company, she stayed on and she was hired by the British government to work on a COVID defense strategy for the nation. So if I didn't do my PhD, that's probably what I'd be doing right now. As it turns out, I did leave the company because you know, even though I enjoyed the job, I really wanted to go back into education. And it was at a time where I thought AI was really, really cool. It was just something which I thought was the future. I really, really wanted to study it. And I thought doing a PhD in it would make me become an expert, I guess. So I applied for the PhD without knowing actually what topic I wanted to do. I didn't know I wanted to go into cancer research. So I just applied to so many universities. I was emailing professors left, right and center around the world. And one stuck out to me, and that was a professor in Shanghai. And he was doing tumor diagnosis, which I thought was really, really cool. He needed someone to work on AI algorithms for this. And you know, I told him I have no background in this at all. How am I meant to do it? And he was like, no worries, no worries. You know, you'll be speaking routinely to hospitals. You'll be speaking to doctors who work on this. They'll tell you what you need. You just have to implement this in a model. I was like, oh, okay, this is pretty cool, this is interesting. So, so yeah, I decided to take up his offer. I applied to the university and yeah, here I am at Shanghai Chaotong University. This is like one of China's most prestigious universities, maybe the top three or four in China. And so if I were to summarize my PhD research in just one sentence, it would be, I want to detect if someone has cancer or not from artificial intelligence better and quicker than doctors currently can, which is a tough ask. And so to do that, I use a class of AI models called neural networks. Neural coming from the word neuron. You have tens of billions of neurons all inside your brain. This is what helps you process information. This is what makes you learn things. They detect patterns in things. And so I try to make an artificial neuron in a computer program. So let me give you a quick example for a test. What can you see on screen right now? A dog, right? Pretty simple. Now how about now? Okay, again, a cat. Very easy, right? And that's because you've seen dogs and cats your whole life. The neurons in your brain learn this. They look for patterns. So for example, a cat might have more pointy ears or it might have dilated pupils. That's the kind of things that the neurons will look out for. They look for these patterns. And this is essentially what a neural network does. It uses artificial neurons, which looks for patterns of pixels in an image. And now, if I was to ask you to classify 100,000 images of dogs and cats, you'd probably swear at me and hit me. But yeah, I'm sure you could, but it would just take you all day. So this is where a computer would come in handy. With a strong enough GPU, this could get 99% accuracy and do this within seconds or minutes. And that's kind of the whole point of AI, because many companies have terabytes of data. It's just impossible for you to manually analyze it. You need to use artificial intelligence models to make it quicker, more efficient, and accurate. But cats and dogs, that's a very oversimplified task, right? So what I look at is medical images, in particular, 
histopathological images. This is when you take a biopsy sample from someone who you suspect to have cancer. You would then look at this under the microscope and try to determine, does this guy have cancer or not? You do that from looking at each of the cells. So normally, if someone has cancer, the nuclei will be bigger and darker and more stronger in color. So you'd be looking for these kind of clues and telltale signs. The problem is though, if you're at an early stage of cancer, it's really, really, really difficult to detect these patterns. And so this is why a computer can be really, really helpful because it can notice these really, really small differences, which the human eye might not be able to do. And so my model is able to look at a histopathological image and classify each and every cell, whether it's a cancer cell or whether it's a normal cell, it can tell you exactly which one it is. And not only that, it helps you learn how these cells are formed and so we can learn a lot more about cancer in general. And so these histopathological images often contain hundreds of thousands of nuclei and this would be almost impossible to analyse every single one if you are a human. So the doctor would normally look at this qualitatively. They will just have a, a general look and a general scan over the image to see if they have cancer. But I don't think that's too accurate and so I want to create a quantitative method so it looks at every single nuclei. And this is a game changer. This will save so, so many lives. And this is really, really important for cancer diagnosis. So I'm really, really excited about this project. I think it will be the future. Not many hospitals are using AI at the moment. They're just using standard routine clinical practices, looking under a microscope, you know, talking amongst each other. Is this cancer or not? Use an AI. You can say with mathematics, you know, you can say with 90% probability, this person will have cancer or 80% probability they don't have cancer. So to show you where mathematics comes into this, let me just show you a quick equation that I'm using at the moment for my model. All right, so in my model, my neural network, I've got two types of data, all right? The first type of data which I have is called the real data. This is the real known location of where the nuclei are, so I know where they actually are. The second type of data is the prediction, okay? This comes from my model. This is where I predict the data to be. And so when you take the difference between the prediction and the real, what you get is the error term, okay? So you wanna compare them. You wanna see how good or how bad your model is, how accurate your prediction is. So this error is just the difference between the two. And so to see where the maths comes into this, we use something called a loss function, okay? A loss function. Now this is written in terms of the error of the model. We write it in terms of the error. And what you want to have is a function which describes the image that you have. So I've made my own loss function which describes a histopathological image. And yeah, so this is what it looks like. It looks really, really nasty, I know, but don't sweat, don't sweat about it. I'll try and explain it really simply. So essentially, this, writ it, this is written in terms of the error and you want to minimize it. You want to make it as small as possible. You want to make it close to zero because you want the error to be zero, right? And so this function basically tries to describe my histopathological image. And so we want to make it really small. And it's actually composed of two distinct functions. So this first function, which I'll highlight just here, is if you take the error, you square it, and then you add up all of those squared errors, and then you divide it by n to normalize it. Simple as that, simple as that. And then this function works really well for lots of types of nuclei, except for a certain few cancerous cells. And that is why we need to introduce this other part of the equation, which I'm highlighting. So when a certain condition is met, which we believe satisfies specific types of nuclei, we apply the error to this function. It's a little bit complicated, so I won't go into it too much, but essentially it's something called a convex smooth continuous Huber loss function. And so depending on the conditions met and what the image looks like, we apply this function to different parts of the image. And if you want to see where the magic happens, here we go. This is my image that I put into my model and bam, there we go. That's what the output looks like. So each color represents a different type of cell. The red ones in particular are the cancerous cells. These are malignant cells. And so genuinely for anyone who is ever thinking of studying mathematics, do it. That is one of the best degrees you can go for because you can work for any company in any sector. As I said before, mathematics 
is really applicable to the real world. It's not just about Pythagoras' theorem or whatever, you can use it for so many different things. So yeah, that's the end of the video. I haven't really spoke too much about my research uh, and what I do for my PhD in general. A few people have been asking, so hopefully you liked it and I can do a lot more videos like this if you want. So yeah, if you're not subscribed, please do so. I will appreciate it. And yeah, I'll see you guys next time.